our series called Diplomacy, Your Questions, Our Answers. And I'm delighted to be here uh, and welcome you on behalf of Ambassador Bricks and all of the faculty at the Diplomatic Academy. Uh, we thought it would be useful to look at uh, US power and influence after this crisis, which is still evolving. And what were the, the trajectories of US power and influence uh, before COVID-19 and where are they likely to go? Uh, what do we know? What is still uncertain? And perhaps get behind the headlines a bit, which seem unanimous that we are in a fundamentally different world. Uh, but we'll ask what has changed and what hasn't with respect to this topic of power and influence. Uh, and on this subject, I can't think of two more qualified people uh, than our guests today. Professor Jonathan Kirshner of Boston College and Professor William Curdy Wolforth of Dartmouth College, both colleges in New England and the US. Both of our guests combine the study of economics with national security and have written on subjects directly or closely related to uh, the matters at hand. Our first speaker will be Professor Kirshner. Dr. Kirshner is Professor of Political Science and International Studies at Boston College. He is the author of American Power After the Financial Crisis, Cornell University Press 2014, and Shanghai People's Publishing House a couple of years later, uh, of Appeasing Bankers, Financial Caution and the Road to War by Princeton University Press, Currency and Coercion, the Political Economy of International Monetary Power, uh, also with a Chinese edition, and many articles and opinion pieces on economic and security policy, as well as on American culture. Uh, and Professor Kirshner is a noted film critic and author, uh, among other works, of Hollywood's Last Golden Age, Politics, Society, and the 70s and 70s in Film in America, Cornell University Press 2012. Uh, so, uh, Jonathan, over to you to start us off, and I'll introduce uh, Professor Wolforth in more detail later. Thanks, uh, John. Uh, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I'll keep my remarks uh, relatively brief, but you'll probably have to stop me anyway. Um, and what I'm going to do is just two things very quickly. One is I want to check in with the U.S.-led international order. And then I want to speculate, with an emphasis on the word speculate, uh, what might change as a result of the current crisis. But I want to start with the American order, and I want to emphasize that uh, if you've been following current events, and that is current events before uh, the recent uh, events, uh, to try and talk about contemporary international politics in any normalizing way since 2007, uh, is to fail to begin to understand what the heck is going on in the world right now. Because even before this current crisis, we had entered into a period of fundamental discontinuity. And in such settings, the familiar past is a poor guide to the near future. And consequence of that is our kind of standard off-the-shelf models do not work. They do not work well in periods of such discontinuity. Um, economists were caught with their pants down at the side of the global financial crisis because they were utterly unprepared to grapple with the nature of an event like that. And we need to think of what was going on in the international order from 2017 uh, forward along those lines. Um, and I want to be clear about this because in 2017, I said in a public lecture like this, um, let me state this plainly. Uh, the U.S. order constructed after World War II and adjusted to taste including a major post-Cold War tune-up, that order is over. All we are doing now is staring in disbelief at a train that has jumped off the rails but has not yet crashed, a disaster that will likely be visible in the wake of the next major exogenous shock. So it's certainly possible uh, that this pandemic is that major exogenous shock, but I want to talk for a few minutes first about the end of the American order. Uh, the American order was forged about three quarters of a century ago by the U.S. amid the ruins of the Second World War. And as I said, I think that has now come to an end. Um, what's interesting is that most people in America are kind of happy about that. An unlikely chorus uh, from across the political spectrum say good riddance to the American order. On one side, there are those who say we should pursue a foreign policy of so-called America first and we can't be bothered with the problems of the world. Others with 
the Iraq war as their principal example in their head, think that the U.S. simply isn't capable of actively engaging the world with adequate discipline and prudence. Uh, my own view is that the nativists are flat wrong, just as they were disastrously in the 1930s, and that the skeptics underestimate the extent to which the American post-war order, for all its visible and profound flaws, contributed to an unprecedented era of peace, prosperity, and security. So let's take a moment or two just to kind of revisit that order. Uh, what the heck was it? And it was really a rather unprecedented thing. Uh, from 1945 to 1950, the U.S. did some things that were very different from anything it had done before. Uh, permanent security alliances, NATO, the U.S.-Japan Security uh, Treaty. Uh, it founded the International Monetary Fund, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, uh, Copernica of other international institutions like the U.S. and more. Additionally, the U.S. paid a disproportionate share of building uh, and maintaining uh, this order, these institutions, although it's important to acknowledge that at times its behavior was exploitative of those institutions as well, for example, in 1971. Right? But nevertheless, a rather dramatic shift and a rather ambitious construction. Why did it do that? Uh, well, it did that because of the half century that came before. Uh, World War I, uh, it's easy for people today to forget the, especially I guess in North America, the trauma of that mass slaughter. Uh, the U.S. tipped the balance in that war. It kind of mulled going internationalist after the war and then kind of said, ah, oh, never mind. Uh, we went from Woodrow Wilson to President Harding and a U.S. interwar foreign policy of isolationism and a U.S. interwar economic policy um, of narrow-minded protectionism, both examples of the so-called America first foreign policy. And so we have the first half of the 20th century. How did that go? Uh, these policies contributed to the Great Depression, abetted uh, the rise of fascists in Germany and Japan, and contributed to the Second World War, which shockingly was even considerably more horrifying than the First World War. So when you come out of the Second World War, mostly people are afraid of repeating the mistakes of the past. There was a real palpable fear after the Second World War that the world economy might slip back into depression. There was a real uh, concern that there might soon enough be a Third World War. And so it was an idea that we would build an order that would learn the lessons of the past. And among those lessons were, was that isolationism and America first did not work. And so the U.S. went instead with something called enlightened self-interest as opposed to narrow self-interest. In, in both of those concepts, self-interest is still there, but in the latter, the U.S. is able to pursue something that Arnold Wolfers called milieu goals, the idea that you would want to shape the world in a way that forged an environment that was conducive for your interests and values to thrive. Okay, so that was the ambition. How did that go? Uh, you can point to lots of ugliness within the American order, but nevertheless, um, it was a period of unprecedented global economic growth and prosperity and a period of unprecedented great power peace. Again, there are lots of complicating factors that can explain this, but if you went to the people who forged the post-war order in 1945 and said, okay, here's what the next 75 years are going to look like, um, they would have viewed that as success beyond their wildest realistic dreams. So, we built an order, it was successful beyond its uh, wildest imaginable dreams, um, and now I'm saying uh, it's gone. So what happened? Why did, this, why did this unraveling of the American internationalist consensus that was permissive of a US-led international order to take place? And um, I would argue that the abdication, uh, uh, the American abdication of its own order can be traced to three factors. One is kind of a simple one, which is the passage of time. Uh, lessons can be learned, but they can be unlearned. Uh, the horrors of the first half of the 20th century are a distant memory. Um, secondly, and this is very important uh, within the United States, is the trauma of fighting two unsuccessful wars. Um, my own focus is on number three, which has to do with the consequences of the uh, misguided U.S. embrace of financial deregulation and financial globalization from the 1990s, decisions that led, I'm going to use the word inevitably, to the global financial crisis. And this is really my takeaway point here, despite everything I've said so far, which is that we live in a moment still, even as we are in this crisis, 
defined by the aftermath of the global financial crisis. I say the aftermath because public policy in the heat of the moment of the crisis actually uh, prevented a second Great Depression. Um, but even though that immediate policy was successful, and this is even more true in Europe than the United States, um, the post-crisis policies were disastrous, leaving in place an inherently fragile and utterly dysfunctional financial system, um, and one that proved utterly indifferent to the misery visited on those most affected by the Great Recession that followed. So we can draw a straight line from the global financial crisis to its post-crisis political management, um, to the manifestations of ugly populism of the left and the right that we can see around the world today. And this is what undermines in the US um, the American internationalist consensus. A lot of people talk about the presidential election of 2016 in, in signifying this, but it's actually the nominating processes in 2016 that signify this change because it was on both sides of the American polity. Um, in 2016, in the Democratic no nominating process, an obscure fringe candidate um, from a, a socialist, or we don't have those in America, from a tiny state who wasn't even a member of the Democratic Party came very close to winning uh, the presidential nomination. And in the Republican primaries, a vulgar, inexperienced game show host blew away a large field of establishment competitors, despite his own intermittent party membership and few fixed principles, aside from a handful that were um, the opposite of what the Republican Party had stood for for three generations. And so what we saw, not in the general election, but festering in uh, the nominating process, the, the bitter harvests of a very difficult several decades for the average uh, American and a frustration with uh, the functioning of the international order as orchestrated by the US and so the U.S. has now shifted um, to a short-sighted transactional approach to international relations. Um, and the American system, I think, has disintegrated and is unlikely to come back. For those of you who study international relations in the room, I think it's fascinating that while we have spent as international relations scholars literally decades talking about uh, hegemonic decline, we never really talked about the notion of hegemonic suicide, which is much closer to the phenomenon that we're witnessing here. All right, I'm gonna take three or four minutes and kind of talk very briefly about um, the consequences of the current uh, pandemic uh, on, on what I have just said, because you know this could be what I described as the exogenous shock that will clarify the rhythms and routines of the new order or the new, more likely, non-order. But I think it's extremely important in having these discussions to be very, very alert to what we don't know. Uh, this current situation is a current situation of uncertainty, not risk. We don't even understand the underlying probability distributions of likely outcomes uh, that might occur. Um, it's not just uncertainty, it's radical uncertainty and contingency, meaning that uh, how things will unfold are dependent upon decision points in the future that we don't yet fully understand now. So to talk about this is to grope uh, in the darkness and speculate about things we can't possibly know uh, uh, at this time. We also wanna be wary to see the crisis through the lens of our existing prior expectations, which is a very common thing for humans to do when faced with questions of uncertainty. This was something that was emphasized by John Maynard Keynes in explaining how businessmen uh, dealt with uh, situations of, of pure uncertainty. So I think it's easier to talk about um, scenarios and things to watch for than it is to sort of make confident predictions about what's going to happen. So I will talk for about three minutes uh, about um, some scenarios for the future and some things that I think are worth watching for, and then I will get out of the way. Um, I think there are um, three possible scenarios we're looking at here at the other end of this. Uh, about the functioning of the world economy, the world system, global governance in general. One is uh, the crisis makes uh, actors scared straight. Uh, they realize it's a global world, uh, that there's a necessity for cooperation and coordination and a kind of push 
for problem solving in Europe, I guess that would amount to a deepening of the capaciousness of the institutions of the European Union. Um, I must say that's an optimistic scenario and I rarely call an optimist, but I think it's definitely one that we should be alert to. Another is the acceleration of the disintegrating trends that we could see present already before uh, the pandemic, a US-China decoupling, a more existential crisis uh, in the European Union, and a re-articulation of political alliances within the Middle East with the US fully withdrawing from them. And a third scenario is the one that usually happens in world politics, which is a sort of mulling through, muddling through in the world looks a lot like it did uh, before the pandemic again. Which one? Which one of those scenarios is most likely? I think it's simply impossible uh, to say at this time, but I think that those are the main branches of likelihood that we could be looking at. I prefer to think more about what we ought to be looking for uh, as we try and understand the international political consequences of what we're experiencing right now. And so here again, there are three things I would call my own attention to. One is this question of legitimacy, political legitimacy. Which countries handled the crisis relatively well and which handled it relatively poorly? Because I think that will speak to the attractiveness of the perceived model of the states involved. And I think it's notable that both the US and, and China are, I think, appropriately seen as performing rather dismally in the context of this crisis, and that in itself may have consequences for the way in which states envision uh, their own uh, interests and alliances and expectations about the future. A second thing, and the thing that is, I think, the most important, consequential, lasting uh, consequence of this crisis will have to do with its influence on authoritarianism. We are, had been witnessing the emergence of increasing uh, regimes associated with personalist authoritarianism, and we are witnessing as well during the crisis the increasing seizure of power by the state. Uh, I'm thinking obviously most uh, in particular of Hungary, but there are other examples of this. And so where the world stands in that regard five years from now, I think may be uh, the most uh, consequential uh, influence of what this pandemic has done on the pattern of world politics. And then finally, to get a little economic-y, what we want to think about is what economists call hysteresis effects, which is a silly word that just means things that endure. And I think that those are going to happen more at the microeconomic level than the macroeconomic level. Um, will there be a kind of unraveling of the so-called neoliberal consensus as the government's role in the economy becomes essential? Will certain sectors of the economy become more traumatically influenced than others? And so we'll see a reorganization of, of how the economy works, um, air travel, movie theaters, are we gonna get back to normal on those? Um, and then thinking outside the box, are we gonna have thinking new thinking about climate change due to uh, the economic influence of this crisis? And are we witnessing, as so many pundits have said we are, uh, the end of the era of globalization and towards something closer to a new era of nationalism and international scapegoating, which does not sound particularly attractive to me. But again, I wanna emphasize that to think about this future, is to engage in exercises of high speculation. And I'll stop there. Excellent, thank you, John. Thanks, Jonathan. I should uh, remind everybody that you can post questions by posting a uh, comment on Facebook, or if you can see the email address behind me, you can email me, which is john.garifano at da-vienna.ac.at. Uh, okay, thank you very much again, uh, John. There's a lot to talk about there. Uh, William Wolforth is the Daniel Webster Professor of Government at Dartmouth College. He's the author or co-author of America Abroad, the United States Global Role in the 21st Century with Stephen Brooks, Oxford 2016, of World Out of Balance, International Relations and the Challenge of American Primacy, uh, Princeton University Press 08 and a Chinese translation following, and of the elusive balance, power and perceptions during the Cold War. Uh, he's also the author of many academic and policy articles uh, on great power relations and foreign affairs and other journals, and uh, has written a lot on Russia and China. So uh, in Hanover, New Hampshire, Bill, the screen is yours. <laughs> 
Well, thanks uh, ever so much, John. It's, uh, it's exciting to be uh, virtually uh, in Vienna. I get to put this uh, on my annual report to the Dean uh, that, I, that I gave this, this lecture to this distinguished group. Very exciting. Um, I, as you uh, can hear from the um, description of my background that Jonathan uh, uh, Garifano kindly gave, I've uh, been working on these kinds of issues of power for, for a long time. And I'm going to, in my remarks, focus, um, focus on uh, the narrower question of American power and influence, as opposed to the larger question of order that uh, Jonathan Kirshner uh, highlighted. The only comment I'll make with respect to the, uh, my distinguished predecessor's comments are that it seems to me that for a dramatic change in order to occur, one would think there would be some dramatic cause, some, some precipitating event. After all, this order had its origins in the Second World War and the emergence of the Cold War. And, and the question kind of is, when we think about both the question of the American-led order and also the uh, trajectory of American power and influence, we want to think, how do we think about these things when we don't necessarily have a decisive event that ends all arguments uh, about uh, the trajectories. And I guess you could think about the question for today's discussion is being whether this pandemic crisis is such an event that will be looked back upon by historians and chroniclers of the 21st century as the event uh, that sparked or that signifies or marks um, a decisive alteration in the pre-existing trajectory of American power and influence. And, you know, with due respect, which uh, really we all must have for the problem of uncertainty that Jonathan Kirshner highlighted, my initial answer to that question is no. Uh, let me just make uh, along those lines three remarks as to why I don't think this uh, pandemic will have that, um, that, uh, th that will be accorded that role uh, by uh, future chroniclers of the century. And the three arguments are basically, let's bear in mind what was driving the pre-pandemic trajectory of American power and influence. Um, and if you look at those things, it, you already had a secular decline uh, in American power and influence underway. And you have to ask, what was driving that? And then ask the second question, which is, will this pandemic either independently affect the trajectory or cause those kinds of events that were uh, the causes that were previously driving the trajectory of American decline to accelerate dramatically? And there I'm going to suggest that the answer is no. And then finally, then the question is, how will this pandemic interact with what we do know affects American power and influence? And I think there, again, we don't know. Uh, Kirshner is absolutely correct. But if you had to guess, I think they will, um, uh, uh, that the pandemic will interact with those causes of American decline in ways to push them slightly in the direction of increasing, namely uh, 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 increasing the trajectory of, uh, trajectory of decline in power and uh, influence. But not such as uh, not 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 as dramatically as I think most commentary today suggests. So those are three points. Let me quickly make them. First, what was the trajectory in American power and influence before this crisis? And yeah, I think almost all observers would agree that you were seeing relative decline from a peak. When was the peak? We can debate it. I think it was around 2003, right around the invasion of Iraq. Um, since then. I think the trajectory has been towards a lowered capability and lowered influence. And what's been driving that? It's crucial to think of that in order to think about the effects of this crisis. I'm gonna just put forward, we can debate this, that the key events, there's a background cause and there are precipitating events. The background cause is essentially changes in the fundamental distribution of capabilities in the world, essentially the rise of China, to a lesser degree, the increased state capacity of Russia, and that's been a sort of background secular change. But there have been events that have shifted perceptions uh, of power and shifted America's influence. And I think those events are events that reveal new information about the United States' capacity to act as a superpower. Um, and so clearly the failure of the transformative project in Iraq and the Middle East 
the failure of the counterinsurgencies in Afghanistan and Iraq, those are failures of the United States to, to achieve those objectives that are central in its own definition, in America's own definition, central to its role in the world as a superpower. And as the information uh, increased, um, uh, 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 that that wasn't going so well for Washington, D.C., you saw a secular decline in, um, in American uh, influence uh, uh, against that background secular increase in Chinese capabilities. And then, of course, you had some fluctuations with various personalities. In hindsight, people thought George W. Bush was the end of the world. Somehow now he doesn't seem like that. Obama was bringing everything back. Everything was going to be great. And now again, we see this fixation on personalities with the arrival of Trump. I do think the Trump election has had effect on this trajectory, primarily along two uh, vectors. Uh, number one is he seems, his, the, the, the arrival of, of Donald Trump seems to convey new information about America's willingness or the basic desire or preference of the polity to perform its role as a superpower. So the world can look at this and make inferences that suggest perhaps the United States will not be there in the future because of its own preferences. And the second effect of the Trump election is dramatically to decrease America's institutional capacity. Pretty much every single American core governmental institution is in a kind of crisis right now within the executive branch, among the three branches of government. And this just makes it much more difficult for the, Amer the United States of America to put into effect any strategy. Uh, even if, you, if, if Trump has a strategy, his ability to affect that strategy is compromised by a government in turmoil in each and every one of its core functions. Uh, and that you can debate, is it, is it reflective of a deeper decline in American institutional capacity or is it a purely Trump-related effect? But again, the world looks and sees information emerging from America that is relevant to its role as a superpower based upon the turmoil that has been uh, occasioned by the arrival of Donald Trump and infers that perhaps the United States is less influential, needs to be deferred to less, needs to be followed less, we need to develop plan B, we need to hedge for the possibility the United States won't be there. So those, I would argue, are the fundamental drivers of the background trajectory we have been witnessing since at least the early 2000 peak of American power and influence in the post-Cold War world. So then the question is the second one, which is, will this crisis and the information it is revealing, both about the world and about the U.S., dramatically transform the pace of that trajectory that I just described. I think it is unlikely to do this, as I suggested, because the pandemic crisis is not at its core a political or geopolitical crisis. It is being politicized. It is being exploited by uh, the rival powers in the world and attempt, uh, they are attempting to use this crisis for their purposes, to be sure. It's an exogenous crisis that has come in and politics being politics will absorb this crisis, will make use of it for political purposes. But at its core, it is not a crisis that is geopolitical or political. And um, the, um, it, therefore, however America is seen to perform during this crisis, that performance is not central to its role in the world to the degree that the factors that Jonathan Kirshner was talking about are, namely security and economics. That's why in some sense America, what you learned about America in 2008, in somehow is more important than what you might learn about America as a superpower on the basis of this crisis. Because responding to global crises of this nature has been a aspect of American self-declared leadership, but it's not been definitive of it, definitive of it or central to it. Therefore, if America, if the United States, if the administration is ultimately seen as having uh, failed in the exercise of leadership, if it is revealed that the United States has various incapacities or institutional deficiencies when it comes to assembling a global response to this pandemic, those things will be viewed, they will be regretted, they will, not they will not necessarily, however, go to the core of the reasons why countries decide or don't decide that the United States is an influential country, the United States is a country to be dealt with. They are important, but they're not central to its role. And therefore, however it pans out, I don't expect the United States performance in this crisis to fundamentally uh, change the nature of that 
trajectory that I already described of the secular decline in U.S. Uh, power and influence. Uh, to, to transform, to have that transformative effect, I think this uh, pandemic crisis would have to dramatically alter the key capacities of the United States or its competitors, China or Russia, uh, to act as superpowers or as expiring superpowers or as great powers. It seems to me that it's possible that this will happen, but unlikely. Indeed, about three powers concerned, Russia, China, and the United States, the one probably where one could forecast a greatest likelihood that the pandemic will reveal institutional uh, incapacities is probably Russia. Um, but here again, we're in this world of deep uncertainty that Jonathan Kirshner discussed. We not only do not know the exact kind of epidemiological patterns and essence of this virus, we also are still learning about the state capacities to respond. Lots of people are trying to issue judgments now about how states have uh, responded or not, since this is the very beginning of the crisis, which is going to go on, at least as far as I understand it, uh, for years, uh, to render those judgments now is at best premature. But it's possible that going forward, we will learn of uh, both either power or weaknesses in the case of these major contending great powers that we didn't know about before, in which case you could see uh, future historians ascribing to this, comp, uh, to this crisis a greater um, uh, causal role than I'm suggesting that it, uh, we're able to describe right now. So that is my second main point, that it's an important crisis, it's a decisive crisis, it's affecting the way we live around the world, but it's not it, at its core a geopolitical or political crisis of the nature that's going to change the fundamental trajectory of America's relative capability in the world. And so just by my final point is uh, to, to stress that that is not to say that there won't be any effects. That is, it does seem likely to me, if I had to guess today, bearing in, if I had to put my money on the table today, that it will interact with those long uh, uh, standing trends that I've discussed in ways that will probably increase the velocity of the trajectory of uh, American pullback from the world. Or at least I would suggest it, would, it increases my, my estimate of the, of the likelihood that uh, what Jonathan Kirsch described as the American suicide as a, a hegemon, or in, 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 to put more delicately, to have the, the American a sort of a considered decision to pull back from the world, or a strategic course towards pulling back uh, from the world. I think those things are made somewhat more likely um, by this crisis. Very quickly now, because I know I'm out of time. Um, Clearly, it's going to place increased fiscal stress on uh, the United States going forward. So arguments are going to occur going forward about whether really we can sustain the level of defense commitment necessary to make credible the alliance commitments around the world. And I know this sounds like a very old-fashioned argument uh, about uh, fiscal stress, but I think those are likely to come to the fore. But I think they're going to come to the fore in a new way, a way that basically gets some members of the public and elite entrepreneurs who want to mobilize them to say, what is the payoff to America's lived daily experiences of these investments in our superpower role? We have just been through the greatest disruption in our daily lives in anyone's memory, probably since the Second World War and the Great Depression. What is the relevance of making commitments to this global role, to this Problem. And indeed, I think the Ameri uh, many members of the public will ask, what are you doing to minimize that we will ever have to go through anything like this ever again? And what is the significance of your grand strategic role in the world to this particular uh, preference of ours, which is never to experience another disruption in our lives, such as the one we've just gone through? And I think it's likely that, or I, it would, I would be surprised if political entrepreneurs on the left and right did not take advantage of that sentiment, which seems to be a very natural human sentiment, to try to craft a much more coherent and frankly much more radical vision of America's pullback from the world than what we've seen either from the Trump administration or from the progressives in the recent uh, uh, election, um, uh, recent uh, Democratic primary election. Uh, they, uh, progressives were toying with the idea of a smaller American global role. It wasn't that full-throated kind of withdrawal, pullback, humbling of America that I think I could easily see political entrepreneurs seizing upon. So on balance, if that does play out, we will perhaps ascribe in the future to this pandemic 
an important uh, causal role in rejiggering the American foreign policy conversation in a way that brings a significant uh, considered decision to pull back from the world much more to the fore than it has been up to now. Uh, with that, I will uh, be quiet and look forward to the conversation. Excellent, thank you very much, Bill. Uh, again, people may post on Facebook or email me at the uh, email that is behind my head on the screen. Um, post in the comments section of Facebook. First, a few questions came up for Professor Kirshner. Let's start there. Uh, here are three. Uh, the first one is related to, uh, I think, something that you and John, you and Bill may disagree a little bit on, uh, which was, uh, the question is, what would it take for another Bretton Woods? So you might have had different views on that, but uh, what's necessary to get there? Uh, the second was the aftermath of the global financial crisis was disastrously managed. Uh, how should it have been managed? What should have been done? And then third, what is your view on the end of globalization? Okay, I can do those. Um, <laughs> Small questions. Uh, the, the notion of a new Bretton Woods, um, no. Uh, the, the U.S. is not going to get into the business of designing a new grand bargain about orchestrating the functioning of the international monetary system. I just don't, I don't see a plausible path to that or what it would look like. I have a very long story to tell about the challenges of international monetary cooperation in general and the factors that are permissive of it. And I'm not gonna get into those tall weeds here other than to say that all of the variables that are suggestive of the prospects for improved international monetary cooperation, those variables are pointing uh, in the wrong direction. Um, quickly, John, remind me of the second question. Uh, what would it take oh, the GFC, the global yeah, financial yeah, crisis. Yeah, um, the, the management of the global financial crisis uh, in the heat of the moment was outstanding. Um, uh, you know, they say everybody's a Keynesian in a foxhole, and the uh, emission of massive amounts of liquidity, uh, the fiscal levers moving in the correct direction, and the swaps offered to the world by the U.S. Federal Reserve, these were crucial in preventing the financial system from completely melting down. However, and I think I, I have made this point, but I think it's appropriate to attribute this notion to Barry Eichengreen, uh, particularly in his book, uh, Hall of Mirrors, which compared the Great Depression to the global financial crisis. There's an irony here in that having the world economy or the U.S. economy in particular not actually fall into the abyss, which was a real possibility, inhibited the prospects for fundamental reforms that could have taken place uh, in the wake of the crisis. So there were two, I'm gonna use the word tragedies that took place in the wake of the global financial crisis. Um, one is that people could return immediately to business as usual. And so people could quickly crawl out of their Keynesian foxholes and the stimuli that followed the crises, and this is a much more tragic story in Europe, um, were too timid. Um, and so the perception, and, and I don't think it was an unfair perception, was that even though we had to save the financial system, what that meant was is that the perpetrators of the crisis, they were kind of safe. They're doing just fine. Uh, but the people who were just sitting there doing, you know, innocently um, suffered the Great Recession and were offered very minimalist uh, support and, and, and sympathy in that wake. And I do think that that divergence uh, clarified trends that were existing particularly in the American economy from at least the 1980s uh, about the differences in the ways in which the system was functioning uh, in, in, with regard to basic uh, fairness for elites and, and, regular, and regular people. And the second failure that took place at the site of the global financial crisis was similarly related to the fact that the, the worst was avoided. I think this is again Barry Eichengreen's phrase in which he talked about the Great Depression being, quote, an implosion so complete that we had to have a reimagination of what the uh, financial sector would look like. And we got a whole host of wonderful reforms that led to, in the United States, you know, 50 years of financial stability. 
um, in the wake of the global financial crisis, um, and this is something that Martin Wolf of the Financial Times has emphasized, we got essentially business as usual, a, a conservative set of reforms that were designed to simply restore the old order in a very modified way. Um, an order that was uh, likely to be met uh, with another crisis in the future. To take a very simple example, the notion of too big to fail. Um, there are larger, fewer, more interconnected, giant financial institutions in the United States now than there were before the global financial crisis. So in, in that sense, and, and even the most modest regulations that we saw introduced after the crisis, Dodd-Frank, the Volcker World, et cetera, those are in the process of being peeled back. So the post, the immediate management of the crisis was excellent. The post-crisis management was dismal and consequential. And, uh, and, and those are the measures, so, so in, a, in a very narrow sense, more aggressive uh, stimulus policies immediately in the wake of the crisis and more aggressive reform of the financial sector. Those two things should have happened. They didn't, and we suffer from those consequences. Um, as to the question of what do I think about the possible end of globalization, uh, this is almost an existential question about the costs and benefits of globalization and I don't think I'm going to be able to do that in 30 seconds, but I will say that the inattentiveness of American social Democrats to the notion that engaging the international economy inevitably generates winners and losers, and that is the responsibility of the winners to attend to the consequences of those things for the losers, is something that slipped away in the United States from the 1980s and again contributed to the rather corrosive political environment that we now see in America today. Great. Thank you. Uh, Bill, a couple for you. Uh, this question of political entrepreneurs. Uh, did political entrepreneurs create the strategies uh, before today, I think strategies of containment, for example, or was it big events like war? And does that have anything to say about uh, your argument, the answer to that question. Another is who would be hurt more by the economic contraction that is happening, the US or China? And I guess more broadly, you know, what probably the impact on relative power, does that matter? Is this uh, economic contraction of the, the scope that we're seeing that significant? Yeah, both great questions. On the causes of grand strategic shift, it's a great question because uh, the uh, commitment of the United States to a global role uh, was a result of the confluence of two, as this is following actually from what, Kirshner, what Jonathan Kirshner said, following from two really quite, well three if you want to think about it, really just quite huge events, the Great Depression, uh, the war and the Cold War, and without that last one, namely the existence in the center of Europe of a global of, a, of an aspiring and seemingly hostile superpower with a overwhelming land power advantage. If those things had not happened, you would not have had the order that Jonathan Kirshner was talking about. And I want to stress: if the last piece, namely the Soviet Union, perceived as a peer threat, had not happened, you would not have had any of the order building that Jonathan that, that he refers to. Um, the Great Depression and the World War were not enough. Uh, if the World War had ended up with two Soviet unions um, and a balance of power in Europe, you would have not had any, any global order uh, uh, led by the United States of America. So that suggests that it takes big things to cause uh, big grand strategy changes. And that's why we have had um, uh, as much continuity as we have had after the collapse of the Soviet Union, because although that, that event was big, it wasn't a sufficient challenge to the basic precepts uh, of American grand strategy to elicit a, a major change. So it's true that you are expecting a kind of, uh, 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 if you had asked me three or four years ago the same question, I would say, well, what's likely to happen, the way change is likely to occur, is likely to be very slow and incremental, uh, a corroding of America's strategy, not a real strategic choice, but a series of smaller choices that add up to, after many years, to a new strategy. And you'd look back and say, oh gosh, I guess America has kind of changed its approach to the world and pulled back. 
what I'm suggesting is that, but I have to say that as even as I say that, I have always been surprised by the failure of the American political system to generate a more coherent um, case for pulling back from the world. I mean, it, it, I think the, I personally believe it's uh, uh, not the optimal grand strategy for the United States to pull back. I think it makes sense to stay engaged, but I respect the intellectual power and the political appeal uh, of the argument for a much more restrained role in the world than the one we've been following. And I've always been surprised that it never seems to eventually. You know, you had Patrick Buchanan and you, you know, Donald Trump, you know, you thought maybe that was gonna be a coherent um, uh, case. And I'm, what I'm suggesting is that the pandemic could, uh, the, the, the effect that, uh, that it has had on people's actual lives could feed uh, a new political entrepreneurship, either on the left or on the right, or who knows, a confluence of the two that could generate a perhaps more pressure for a real strategic decision um, um, uh, to alter the course of America's engagement with the world than we've seen. Again, I, I can't put a probability on it, but it's possible. But I agree with the premise of the question, which is it's hard to change a superpower's grand strategy without a very large stimulus. Instead, what you tend to get is incremental change over time. Regarding the effects of the pandemic on the relative power of the three, let's just, for simplicity, there's a lot of other players in the world, but let's just for simplicity's sake, focus on the US, Russia, and China, and particularly the US and China. I will really have to defer on bona fide experts on the Chinese system to, to, um, uh, uh, to, to try to estimate uh, the degree to which the political, institutional, and fiscal strains uh, that the relative slowdown in their growth is going to cause on them to estimate their effects on that country's capacity to act as a superpower. I don't think, from my kind of long uh, study of the rise and fall of powers, I don't think that the sort of direct costs um, on the sort of the hit to the Chinese budget and the reduced GDP growth rate is going to, are going to be the major factors far more potentially disruptive to China's global ambitions would be much more political and institutional ones, where the Chinese Communist Party's ability to lead that country and to extract resources from that country for global purposes is compromised by unending series, a cascading series of domestic challenges. Experts on China do stress that a substantial portion of the security energies of that polity, of that government, are basically domestically focused to hold on to the uh, to 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 maintain leadership uh, and to maintain security domestically. If this if this crisis results in a dramatic uptick in those costs, and yet at the same time somehow the U.S. comes out better than most people think it does now, then you could actually see the crisis affecting China's trajectory more than the U.S. trajectory. Again, I think those are speculative, but they're at least things worth thinking about. Great. Uh, John, did you want to respond to the first point or no? Uh, I think it was Bretton Woods or creation, the Soviet role of the Soviet Union. In no, I think that's exactly right. Uh, no Soviet Union, no American order. Okay. Uh, a couple more questions, which could be for both of you. Uh, one gets to uh, something I think Jonathan brought up first. Considering the effective response of COVID-19, uh, and pandemics by Taiwan. Do you, do you, and if so, how do you foresee change of Taiwan's position in the global order? Recognition, support, relations with PRC, et cetera. So it's about this question of whether, or maybe Bill also referred to it, um, does the management or the, success, the better and worse management of this crisis matter uh, significantly? Uh, do you consider that the manner of response to COVID-19 will enable less relevant, quote, less relevant, end quote, states to become more prominent in the global order uh, and vice versa. So uh, I think that those are both in a sense about legitimacy and responses. And I would add on to that, do you, got, do you both have a sense of what is the role of uh, Europe in uh, any of this response and future order? Either you, Bill, do you have a thought? Uh, well, I would say there's a very, I have, I'm an assiduous follower uh, of, 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 of an academic 
an expert analytic literature that seeks to get exactly at this point, which is kind of uh, how countries, um, um, smaller countries often, or, or you know, non-superpowers, how their significance in international politics can be affected uh, by a range of factors. Uh, their perceived confidence uh, in dealing uh, with a crisis like this, the roles they play in international institutions and development and so on and so forth. And it's a, it's a fascinating, it's a fascinating literature. And I think it's possible that, and, and there's, a, there's a great politics around this as smaller countries and middle range countries and regional influentials seek to leverage events to propose and propound their diplomatic brands and they rise and fall on these things. And I think it's a, it's a very interesting literature. I don't think the effects of that are, go I don't think these are, this is a realm in which we're gonna talk about system transforming or order transforming kinds of events. And I don't think the questioner assumed that. I just think that um, uh, it, it's a fascinating, who's rising and who's falling. And on that one, I would really stress uh, the degree to which we are all still uncertain about which governmental response will come to, but will be judged by history or judged by a, a, a year, two years, three years, five years from now as having been the, um, the most um, uh, uh, praiseworthy, uh, the one which one would most want to emulate. When Jonathan Kirstner talks about the responses to 2008 and the debates over, that was a situation in which, and I'll defer to him on this, but I think I have read a lot of what he's written, where the policy prescriptions of what an optimal response would be were there to be picked up. There was an actual way to respond, which was lodged in sort of economics and history and social science and good governance principles for how to come out of that in a way uh, that would have left the overall welfare and security of the society in a much better position. In the case of how to respond to a pandemic like this, where you're doing, I'm, I know people want to say that this trade-off doesn't exist, but when you're confronting this trade-off between opening and, contr and controlling the, uh, the pandemic. That's one where there's very little to, very little to go on. Uh, and so I'm a little bit, I mean, just to put this in more kind of current eventsy terms, um, when our infectious disease expert Anthony Fauci was asked this question about how do you judge between opening schools and the, the damage that is being done to children by not going to schools and then the health effects of opening the schools, I mean, eventually he had to say, we have no idea. I mean, there's just really no way to assess that trade-off. If you multiply that trade-off a hundred times to all of the other questions all of these countries are facing, I have to say, I really just don't know how well, um, uh, uh, the, the, who, which country is going to win the sweepstakes as the best responder to the pandemic two or three years down the road. So... I have a different set of reactions to the same question, but one that I think speaks to some things that Bill and I have been dancing around slightly. Um, on the question of small states, I think I'm going to go the full Wolferth here uh, and just focus on power. And I just don't, I think that power is too determining of influence uh, in, 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 the, in the world. And so I don't see a kind of transformative thing where small, very uh, effective states that do well in the pandemic will somehow have a greater influence in shaping the nature of global governance. But on the other hand, I think what, what it sounds to me that what Bill and I, where we have disagreed in this discussion, what we're really disagreeing about is the balance of the significance of power and purpose. I think we both have emphasized the significance of power and purpose, but I think I have tended to stress a little bit more on the purpose side and build a little bit more on the power side. And that's why I think the American order is toast uh, because I think that uh, American purpose has been shifting and that this may be sort of a clarifying moment in which we come to understand the choices that the US is making in that regard. But to shift back from that towards uh, the question of the response to the crisis, I therefore would go back to the combination of power, purpose, and legitimacy, but still look at relatively large players in the international system. And again, as we've both emphasized correctly, I think, in a situation of radical uncertainty, one needs to be very cautious about the prognostications you would make. But it strikes me, sitting here at this moment, in this early stages of what we've seen, 
Um, neither the U.S. nor China has handled this situation in a way that makes it look attractive to others. And I do think that that is likely to have international political effects with regard to the ways in which the U.S. and China are perceived as attractive partners or models for countries in the future and getting to Europe, about which I am very reluctant to speak because I am not an expert in Europe. Uh, at the moment, it does seem uh, to an outside non-expert that Germany has done a fairly good job, uh, comparatively speaking, of managing the crisis. And that really points to the larger question of the future of Europe. And back to the existential crises that Europe is facing with regard to its own future. Is this going to be a moment in which German leadership suddenly looks uh, more attractive and Germany embraces that role? Or are the forces that were already pulling the European project apart going to accelerate because of this? Um, Everybody, it was, it was understood by the Europeans who founded the European order that the, that the economics was running ahead of the politics and that the um, monetary side of the economic equations were running ahead of the fiscal side of the equation. But these big questions can no longer be postponed. Uh, without a much more enhanced unified fiscal capacity in Europe, and without, and I want to say this pointedly, Europe making clear what is appropriate as a style of governance to be a member of the European Union without asserting those two things, fiscal capacity and the character of European identity. I think that despite Germany's so far perceived to be excellent performance, relatively speaking, in dealing with the crisis will not matter as much as these forces that will render the project unsustainable over the long term. There's a question related to this, and so I might just uh, throw it in, on the, and it, you've, you've addressed it, I think, very eloquently in a sense, but it asks, how will the pandemic affect uh, the EU approach towards integration? And if we broaden that to, does the pandemic lead to greater or uh, lesser integration in general, thinking back to this old, uh, I think, Gaddis article, I don't remember if it became a book, this inter integration and disintegration, and he was writing around uh, 2000, I guess. Uh, but do either of you, Bill, I don't know if you have a comment on John's very uh, fine points on the EU there, or on this question in general of integration and disintegration. And that may be the last one we have. The I'm, 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 I'm hesitant by the fact that I know that among those people who may be listening, there are people who know so much more about Europe from, from a, as a non-expert who consumes rather than produces research on the uh, events uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the EU. It does look like the, um, the story that I get is a national, it's a story of national responses that many citizens and countries look to their national governments and have looked to their national governments in the face of this pandemic. And I think it's fair to say that is a global response. Basically, of course, of course, the United States and some federal states are even looking to uh, the lo their local, um, uh, uh, sub-national local governments uh, as, uh, for leadership. And I just don't think in the popular imagination and even beyond the mass public into many sectors of the elite, that the global level is particularly significant, and I think that's also the case in um, uh, the EU. Uh, Jonathan refers to the uh, uh, Germany's uh, excellent response, but it's fundamentally a national response. Obviously, there's a lot of other, it doesn't, it's, it's, it's my understanding, it's not one among a core competency of the EU to deal with pandemics, although there's obviously a lot of, of, of coordination. But at the global level, I think for the de old debate on the role of the nation state, uh, I mean, we could have, with, with leadership, with a different international system, with a different United States, with a different, uh, we could have had a, a much more auspicious uh, global role in confronting this pandemic. Um, but right now, I think in the popular imagination and beyond that, uh, the lesson that's coming out of this pandemic is when bad stuff happens, when the world gets bad, when you're scared for your family and your future, the place to look to is your national government for salvation. And when you're lucky and you have a competent one, that's great. If not, tough luck. 
Thank you. John, anything else? Any final comments from either of you? Uh, I would make two. One very briefly to respond to your question about um, will Europe uh, become more or less integrated? I think the answer is definitely yes. Uh, meaning I do think that it is going to have to be one or the other. Uh, that's been said before at other crisis moments, but I think it's particularly true now. And secondly, I do want to return to uh, the hippopotamus in the room, which is the uh, American national election uh, coming up uh, presumably in November. Um, if, uh, if President Trump is reelected, then that will be a fundamentally transformative event of the place of the United States in the world and how it is perceived from which we will not be retrieved. Professor Wolforth, anything else? I, I wish I could disagree uh, with what Jonathan just said. I think it's probably uh, more true than I'd like to admit. All right, well, thank you both. I know you're very busy, I appreciate. We appreciate your taking the time. Uh, this has been very informative. And thank you all uh, for listening. So uh, until the next uh, event, uh, good day. <laughs>